The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, I'm very excited today. Uh, I have been this excited in a while. Um, who do we have with us today? Today, we have Gil Rabinovich, who is professor of neurology and radiology at UCSF and director of the NIH Alzheimer's Center at UCSF. Welcome to the Jerry Powell podcast, Gil. Hey, Eric and Alex. Great to be here. Uh, we're going to be talking about all things amyloid and dementia today. Uh, really excited. Topics like pet, uh, amyloid scans and all these new drugs out there. The MAPs. amyloid antibodies, the MABs, as Alex calls them. Is that just Alex or is that more people than besides Alex, Gil? It's it's much easier to say than uh, monoclonal antibodies. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> bonus points if you can pronounce all the antibody names correctly today. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see how many of you and Alex could actually do. Um, uh, but before we get into that topic, Gil, do you have a song request for Alex? I do. I'm going to request the song, I'm Not Going to Miss You by Glenn Campbell. Ah, tell us why. So um, I think as many listeners probably know, Glenn Campbell uh, suffered from Alzheimer's disease and um, actually a documentary was filmed sort of documenting his, his last tour as he performed during while he was symptomatic with the disease. And this is a song he wrote with a close friend expressing his feelings about what it's like to have Alzheimer's disease, what some of his thoughts are. I think it's very poignant. It's really a beautiful love song. And it gives a voice to people with Alzheimer's, which I think is very important. So thank mm -hmm. you for indulging me. Yeah, I love that. And uh, it's a beautiful, poignant song, as you say, but it's also a little tongue in cheek. <laughs> like, I have dementia. I'm not going to miss you. Um, I know <laughs> it could go dark, but I think it's really more reflecting his sense of humor as I read yeah. about sort of how he wrote the song. Right. Okay, here we go a little bit. I'm still here, but yet I'm gone I don't play guitar or sing my songs They never defined who I am The man that loves you till the end You're the last person I will love You're the last face I will recall And best of all I'm not gonna miss you I'm not gonna miss you Dang, that's kind of heartbreaking. <laughs> Gets me teary-eyed every time. Yeah. So, Gil, um, we, we like to start off with all these podcasts. It's like how how our guests became interested and passionate in the work that that you do, in particular around dementia. How how did you get interested in this field? For me, it really started, Eric, with falling in love with the brain as an organ, and this started actually even before I went to college. Um, a good friend of mine was in a head-on collision with a bus and sustained a traumatic brain injury. He's made a fantastic recovery. But um, after he was hit, he had a really dense retrograde amnesia where he recognized his family, but he really had very little memory about basic elements of his life. And then as he recovered, he had this amazing experience where memories would come flooding back to him. So he would describe walking back into the room where he had grown up and having a flood of memories about things that had happened in that room from a birthday cake to a first kiss and he described how he would take a book off his bookshelf and you know had no memory of ever reading the book would read the first few pages and the whole plot would just come flooding back into his brain oh, and wow. um, so i thought this was just about the most fascinating thing i'd ever heard and i started to read oliver sacks which i think is true of many neurologists you know a mm -hmm. fabulous writer if listeners haven't um, read his work uh, talking about um, brain behavior 
And then in college, I had this fabulous mentor named Bob Sapolsky at Stanford who gives unbelievable talks about brain behavior relationships. And when I was a senior, he taught a uh, seminar called Mechanisms of Neuron Death which was basically a seminar about neurodegenerative diseases and what was known about them, you know, back in the late nineties. And, um, you know, I looked back just a few years ago on some of the notes that I had taken about Alzheimer's disease and actually our knowledge about the disease um, hasn't changed that much since I took that <laughs> class in college, but that uh -oh. kind of set me on that trajectory. So I fell in love really with behavioral neurology before I even knew that I wanted to be a doctor. And, you know, then there was a strong feeling that I wanted to also take care of patients. And so the path to neurology and behavioral neurology was kind of paved by those um, early experiences. And we we just did a podcast, what was it, about a month ago, Alex? I forget, with Jason Carlowish about his, his new book. And, and man, we talk about how maybe things haven't changed a lot in the last 20 years, 30 years with dementia. But... Um, you know, you you get a sense that that the next ten years, <laughs> maybe, maybe ushering in potentially a new era or not. Kind of, how, how do you feel where we are right now with uh, dementia, dementia diagnosis, dementia therapeutics? Do you feel like we're at that precipice? I do. I do feel like we're at a precipice. So when I think back just on how much has changed um, in the 15 years that I've been training to take care of patients with dementia and caring for people, um, you know, a lot of the breakthroughs have happened in the biomarker space. So our ability to identify the pathology of plaques and tangles in living people, um, initially with spinal fluid tests and then with imaging tests, PET scans. And now in the last few years, I think really exciting um, progress in blood biomarkers that can very reliably detect amyloid and tau in a much more scalable, cost-effective way. And so um, these biomarkers are incredibly important um, for a lot of reasons. First of all, they help us understand the human disease. And so a lot of what we know about Alzheimer's is really what we know about Mousheimer's disease. It's based on animal models that are based on- Did you just you call know, it Mousheimer's? Mousheimer's. Oh yeah, you haven't heard that term before? Yeah. I was like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> now, you know, I, I don't want to belittle, you know, I think, you know, you know, animal models are really important. They teach us about molecular mechanisms, sure. but it is important to understand that the animal models that we have for this disease are based on mutations that cause familial Alzheimer's. And those mutations cause 1% of cases of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the changes that are seen in the mice may represent, you know, 1% of the totality of the human disease. And what we can now do, thanks to advances in biomarkers, is we can follow people prospectively, longitudinally, and understand more about how amyloid and tau are forming as the brain ages, how they interact with the brain structure and function, how they ultimately lead in some people, though not all, to cognitive changes. And so having that human model to study the disease has been incredibly important. Um, we don't have biomarkers for everything that happens as the brain ages, and we might get into that, but that's you know another problem, which is that we can only see part of the story of what's going on in the brain mm -hmm. at a molecular level. The other thing is it's really transformed how we do drug trials. And so, you know, in the past, um, when uh, people did, uh, you know, a clinical trial, say for an amyloid lowering therapy in Alzheimer's disease, we included only people at the dementia stage because we couldn't really reliably diagnose Alzheimer's before that. We included them based on clinical criteria which when you compare them to autopsy results are only about you know, 80% accurate, even at expert centers. And then finally, we actually had no idea if the drugs that we were giving in a drug trial were engaging the target, were they modifying the biology of the disease? And so we were really running blind. And to me, these advances that we have in biomarkers um, are kind of a prerequisite for being able to do better drug trials. I think we are doing better drug trials now, and that I think is over time inevitably going to lead to effective therapies. So um, I do see major progress. Uh, you commented on my background. I am a Cubs fan, so by nature I'm a very optimistic person. So I think everything I say, you know, with, with a little bit of a grain of salt. But you no, know, that said, I think we really are 
you know, at a precipice and at a very exciting time uh, to be uh, involved in this disease as a researcher and, and as a doctor. That's why we what couldn't include key... Ken Kavinsky in this podcast because having two Cubs fans <laughs> on at once is just... it would be too much. Too much for our <laughs> listeners, except in the Chicago area. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alex, you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say, you know, one of the other um, points that Jason Carlowish raised in in his book and in the podcast was how we have discovering we're, we're we're now pretty certain that Alzheimer's is a heterogeneous group of diseases. And that we will be discovering, you know, ways to test for different forms of Alzheimer's and to treat uh, different forms of Alzheimer's. I wonder if you have any commentary on that that observation as well. Yeah, I mean, you could think about that at, on two levels, right? So one is, you know, dementia is heterogeneous, and so um, you know that what we see and what matters to patients, of course, is when they develop, you know, changes in their cognition and their function. But that is a result of a variety of different molecular processes. And plaques and tangles are part of that story. Um, but we know that there are many other important things that um, contribute to cognitive decline, vascular changes in the brain, other proteins that accumulate in the brain, like alpha-synuclein and TDP43. And so, um, you know, the, the reason that any individual might develop dementia might differ quite a bit. And we can only measure some of those molecular changes now, amyloid and tau, yes, the others, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about heterogeneity is, is Alzheimer's defined as a plaque and tangle disease. Is that a heterogeneous disease? And I do think that probably we will learn that it is. In some people, we talked about, you know, 1% of people who have, you know, autosomal dominant mutations, that cause them to overproduce this A beta peptide that forms plaques. These people get Alzheimer's disease with about 100% penetrance with these mutations. So that's 1%. We know, you know that about 60% of people have a genetic risk factor called APOE4, and that may have contribute to the risk of a disease through a variety of different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But you know, there are also um, probably other pathways that lead to plaques and tangles, and they may differ from patient to patient. So in some patients, it may be related to some inflammatory event that led to activation of the innate immune system in the brain. And that might've occurred, you know, and precipitated the pathology of plaques and tangles. In other people, um, it may be a traumatic brain injury that, you know, maybe set some of these things in motion. In other people, it may be vascular disease that leads to changes in the inflow and outflow of some of these proteins. And so I think there are probably different upstream pathways that are leading to this common phenotype of plaques and tangles. And then, you know, the final angle you might think about it is the clinical phenotypes of the disease are heterogeneous. So, yeah. you know, most people present with memory loss, but other people who have plaque and tangle disease present with primary problems with their language function mm -hmm. or their spatial function, or in some people even changes in their behavior and personality. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of layers to heterogeneity yeah. in this disease, and we're just starting to peel some of those layers off now. Mm -hmm. Given that, um, how how important right now, given that, I mean, we won't dwell a lot on like the cholinesterase inhibitors and Namenda's out there of how effective they are. Like in general, my feeling is like, man, uh, is, is, is a good summary of the evidence around them. It doesn't really help. Yeah, that it's much. interesting, though, Eric, because, but, you know, some people do respond in the sense that they actually um, do get better. Yeah. These tend to be people, especially who have a Lewy body disease, um, where cholinester, you know, acetylcholine deficiency may be a big driver of some of their functional brain changes. Um, you know, for most people, I agree, they don't um, notice an improvement. It doesn't stop a decline over time, and it's very hard to know if these drugs even work because. You know, people don't feel better and over time they get worse. So, and there's nothing you can measure to say the drug is or is not working. So yeah. absolutely no, no argument that we need much better therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, as we think about like the, the much better, like it's really exciting to think like we can target these, these things like amyloid. But before we talk about that, like right now with, with let's say targeting from a diagnostic perspective with um, pet amyloid scans, where do you think we are right now with the use of both these pet amyloid and these biomarkers in helping us determine kind of what's going on with this heterogeneity of this person that's in front of us that may have memory complaints, uh, 
or we may have concerns around their memory. W where do you feel we are right now? So, you know, I'm coming at this from a perspective of a dementia subspecialist, right? So, um, you know, people who come and see me or others in our center are really looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the biomarkers in and of themselves are not sufficient to diagnose Alzheimer's, but in the right clinical context, just like any lab test that we use in medicine, they can actually provide a lot of certainty about what you are or are not dealing with. And so, um, you know, a common question is, you know, I'm experiencing some mild symptoms. Are these normal for age or is there something more insidious that I need to worry about? Um, a lot of patients who come to see us have atypical symptoms that I alluded to a little bit with the atypical Alzheimer's phenotypes. These folks are dismissed a lot of times um, as, um, you know, just having depression or a midlife crisis. They tend to occur in actually younger people in their 50s and 60s where, you know, Alzheimer's may not be sort of high on the radar of the, of the physician who's doing the first assessment. The people who develop visual problems often end up seeing an optometrist, an ophthalmologist. They might have, you know, cataract surgery mm. before someone actually figures out that it's a brain problem, not an eye problem. And so, you know, in those patients who are really seeking answers, when we can recognize these phenotypes and then we have a biomarker that can support the presence of the key pathology, that can really, um, I think, empower patients and families to understand what they're dealing with at a relatively early stage, and it gives them choices about, um, you know, future planning, um, the ability to sort of guide the next few years when the patients are still in an early stage and can actually make these decisions and have a voice in these decisions early on. A lot of people actually, amazingly, find it a relief when they when I show them an amyloid scan, and you know, there's a lot of red that you can see, and that represents amyloid in the brain, and they say, you know because you've had these symptoms and we have we evidence of amyloid and you're relatively young so we don't think the amyloid is just incidental there they feel you know like these symptoms that have been actually sometimes for years dismissed as you know nothing to worry about mm. um, are validated with a true biology and now they're like okay now i can end this diagnostic odyssey and move yeah. on to the next step which is what do i do do i decide to be in a clinical trial you know, um, do I retire from my work? Um, a lot of really core decisions. And also, you know, having that objective evidence, um, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen this quite a bit, but sometimes there's a lot of controversy where the patient and their spouse may not agree on what's going on. And, you know, the child that lives in New York, we're in California, you know, who talks to mom once a month. This is a familiar story. I can yeah. see your smile. The, when when I was in New York, it was always the daughter from California. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. But um, so, you know, the, the um, having that, um, you know, that biological evidence can end a lot of these kinds of disagreements and everyone can sort of come to the same place of, you know, this is serious and this is what we're dealing with. And now let's move on and think about the next step. So I found that they, you know, that amyloid PET can help. Tau PET scans are something that we've been able to use also. And they're very helpful because there's a really strong, unlike amyloid, there's a really strong correspondence between where tau tangles are in the brain and the specific symptoms that patients have. So people who have memory loss show tangles in memory areas and yeah. the temporal lobes, et cetera. So looking at those pictures also can help patients and families sort of understand the disease. Now that said, these, you know, these biomarkers are expensive. They're not accessible everywhere. And that's where I think blood uh, markers are really going to transform the field because if you have a blood marker that can tell you about amyloid and tau in the brain with pretty high accuracy, or even if it can just rule out the presence of these proteins in a large number of people, reducing the number of people who need to have a PET scan or a spinal fluid test to confirm that these proteins are present in the brain, then I think we're dealing with something that's much more tenable from a public health point of view, from a global health point of view, as opposed to saying everyone, you know, who is concerned about symptoms, you know, is going to need a very expensive invasive yeah. test. And for, for like a pet amyloid, how much does the amount of amyloid in the brain actually correlate with like the severity of disease um, it, or potentially where they are in the progression? 
It depends on the stage. So um, in what's called the preclinical stage of the disease, where there's evidence that the pathology is happening, but people don't yet have symptoms, or even in the early symptomatic stage, people with higher levels of amyloid are more likely to progress than people with lower levels of amyloid. But then it reaches a relatively early plateau, even in you know the stage that we call mild cognitive impairment or MCI, where people have, you know, have cognitive impairment, but are still functionally independent. And so at that point, you kind of lose any correlation between um, how much amyloid is in the brain and the symptoms. So at that point, it becomes more, you know, is the pathology there or not? But, you know, one, one misconception I think that people have about amyloid PET scans is that they only represent the amount of amyloid. And it's true, the tracer is binding to amyloid. But actually, um, amyloid is very strongly related to tau tangles, and tau tangles are very strongly related to symptoms. And by the time there's enough amyloid in the brain to have a positive scan, there's actually a lot of tau in the brain as well. And so even though it's not directly measuring plaques and tangles together, mm. when, once you have a positive PET scan, it tells you not only is there significant amyloid, but very likely there's also significant tangles. And that actually information has much stronger prognostic value. And so, the, you know, these scans aren't super sensitive to early stages of amyloid. And once they're positive, we found that they're about 90% accurate in our um, center, for example, not just in predicting amyloid at autopsy, but who actually ends up with an autopsy diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease as the cause of their dementia syndrome. Yeah. And I remember from another one of your studies, uh, I, th I think about a third of patients who we thought, and these were in like neurocenters, right? That, um, that we thought had Alzheimer's disease, had a negative amyloid, and about a half of those we thought didn't have Alzheimer's disease actually had some amyloid in their brain. Is that about right? Yeah. So, you know, this is, you know, as clinicians, we can only get so far in terms of, you know, characterizing people clinically. And at the end of the day, it's the biology that's going to matter probably, at least in terms of, you know, some of the therapies that we'll be discussing today. And so, um, you know, it kind of reminds me of, you know, in med school, when you were learning, when you were auscultating the heart, and you were learning to do all of these provoking maneuvers to try to distinguish, you know, like aortic stenosis from mitral regurgitation. And at the end of the day, you do the echo and you figure out which one it is, right? Yeah, so right. that kind of reminds me of that, you know, trying to use our clinical acumen. I mean, we're pretty good at it, but not good enough, you know, and especially not in early stages where, um, you know, we're trying to identify a biology based on pretty mild clinical symptoms that can be difficult to distinguish just from aging. And do you think, this is my last question about uh, amyloid scans, until maybe after we talk about, you know, future therapies, do you think in a wider practice outside of where the Alzheimer's, Center. Alzheimer's centers, um, where people actually are thinking this through and working through the diagnosis, do you think there is a wider role right now for these scans in the community? You know, the current um, guidelines for appropriate use that have been um, published by the Alzheimer's Association and Society for Nuclear Medicine really state that at the moment, these should be used by specialists, that they don't have a role. I'm talking about PET scans and, yeah. and spinal fluid tests. They don't have a role in primary care they really are should be considered an adjunct to um, a clinical evaluation by a specialist, including you know all the typical things that we do in labs and structural imaging, CT or MRI. And if a specialist at the end of that workup is still uncertain about the cause of impairments, and an amyloid scan is going to change their diagnosis and management, which it may or may not, depending on what their differential is, that's really the utility right now. And I think. You know, one of the concerns about blood tests, which will be accessible to everyone and will probably be marketed. In fact, we have some evidence now that they're being marketed directly to consumers. Um, you know, there's a risk not only that these biomarkers will be used and interpreted by the wide you know, population of physicians, but actually the patients themselves might be getting these tests and then coming to the doctor with the tests in hand asking for an interpretation. And so, um, you know, blood tests really change the game here. And I think that, you know, while I think that um, these are best used by specialists who understand yeah. the nuances and the limitations of all of these tests, 
The reality is, just as with direct-to-consumer genetic testing, we're very likely to be looking at direct-to-consumer Alzheimer's blood biomarkers mm -hmm. in the next five years. And you know, we'll, we're going to have to adjust to it in terms of our clinical practice. And do the blood biomarkers supplant the PET scan, or how how do you are they do they do we use them in conjunction in the like how do you think they'll be used in the future? I think they will. Um, you know, the data so far, and these need to be replicated in larger and more diverse cohorts, and you know, more in real care than in academic centers. So, with a lot of caveats. The markers seem to be pretty good at telling who has amyloid and tau in their brain and who doesn't. They don't tell you what the imaging tells you, which is where or how much, Yeah. but they could be very useful in ruling out amyloid and tau in a large number of people. And then if you really need to confirm their presence, you can do a spinal fluid test or a PET scan, which may be you know, more specific, but you could set a threshold that would be sensitive for these yeah. blood tests that would allow you to rule out the disease in a large number of people. And um, I think that would be very helpful for practice. But inevitably, it's also going to detect amyloid and tau in people who don't have symptoms. And, um, you know, they're going to be looking to find out if they're at risk for Alzheimer's. And yeah. I think we as a field are going to have to adjust to that because it's coming. Yeah. yeah. Are, are we going to pivot to talk about treatments now? Yeah. Let's Can talk I do about the pivot? Treatments. Uh, I've got I've got two pivots. Okay. okay. Here's the first pivot. <laughs> so every year Eric uh and Ken Kavinsky do a, a summary of uh, you know groundbreaking articles uh in geriatrics at the American Geriatric Society meeting and then I do parody songs uh for you know selected articles. And so they're going to present an article about atacanumab um uh, this year. And so as a preview, I've worked up uh, some lyrics for this. I'm interested in your thoughts on them. Uh, this is based on supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> Super atacanumab is not that efficacious, even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious. If you say it loud enough, it, but you'll always sound precocious. Super atacanumab is not that efficacious. Um, do little um, do lie, um, do little um, do lie. Dementia is a bad disease, as everybody knows. Lots of people want a cure, but this one kind of blows. <laughs> I'll stop there. That's my first pivot. <laughs> so you Pretty passed new. the first test, which is perfect pronunciation of aducanumab, which can be, you know, <laughs> quite the tongue twister. Aducanumab? Aducanumab? Aducanumab. Adju. Aducanumab. It's kind of like edu. Adju. Okay. Um, the second pivot is that generally we don't do screening tests. Like, so, uh, uh, without having a treatment yeah. and with the proliferation, as you're talking about, of all these, you know, imaging blood tests, uh, many of us can foresee a day in which, as you'd say, um, these will be widely available. Um, what, 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 what's in the pipeline as far as treatment and uh, aducanumab in particular? Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say one word about that, which is, um, you know, that I think there are even short of sort of pharmacological therapies, there are a lot of things that, um, you know, people might change um, in terms of their behavior and lifestyle, if they learn that they're at risk for developing Alzheimer's in the next few years. Um, and studies have shown this, right? So even though we all know that we should eat healthy and sleep well and avoid stress and exercise regularly, um, studies show, for example, that people who learn that have they have a genetic risk for Alzheimer's, the APOE4 gene, are actually much more likely to make those changes than people who find out that they don't have that risk factor. Um, you know, we all know that we should, you know, get our advanced directives in line and get everything ready in case we're not able to make decisions for ourselves in the future. But you know, there's a powerful motivator when you learn that you might be at risk of losing that capacity, and that that may be you know, happening much, much um, sooner than you would hope. And so um, I do think that there are, um, you know, some very uh, actionable um, mm -hmm. results of finding out. Now, would I want to know that I have amyloid and tau in my brain if I have no symptoms? No. But, mm -hmm. you know, actually, if we polled our, our uh, lab members um, who are of a different generation, and many of them said they would want to know, you know, as they get older, if they were at risk, you know, this comes a lot towards, you know, are you seeking information? Are you, um, you know, I, there's almost a generational gap, I think, in how we think about these things. We just recently had a grand rounds in neurology about blood biomarkers mm 
and we asked whether people would want to know. Okay, that was the last question. It was a Zoom poll, and uh, the split was 51 49. Uh. <laughs> and so, you know, I think that there's no no correct answer and no and, easy answer. And just because I have, let's say, amyloid in my brain, does that mean I'm going to at some point develop the It symptoms? means you have a higher risk of developing yeah. cognitive impairment. It doesn't mean that you will uh, develop it um, inevitably. Yeah. The studies that follow people prospectively show, you know, that... Um, the risk separation between people who are positive or negative for amyloid starts to occur around three years after the biomarker assessment. And then it gets bigger and bigger as you follow people over time, such that, you know, if you follow people for 10 years, maybe 70% who were positive are likely to develop some clinically meaningful cognitive impairment, but not everyone. Yeah, Others yeah. might die of other causes. Some people might have resilience in their brain and never develop symptoms. So it's a risk factor and it should be thought of as that, yeah, not yeah. as a determinant of developing impairment. And I also want to say thank you for um, uh, pointing out that there are things we can do. And that we some of our other guests uh, on a prior podcast about um, uh, comprehensive dementia care said, we need to stop saying there's nothing we can do about this because we know there are things we can do. And many of these yeah. are non-pharmacological treatments and right, like right. The dementia care program, the care ecosystem, um, all of the factors that you mentioned just a moment ago. But I think we want to pivot to Aducanumab before. Yes, the, I'm this, stalling. This whole, okay. <laughs> whole, like the idea of like the amyloid hypothesis that, that we are going to look for amyloid and if amyloid is there, we're going to get rid of amyloid potentially through these amyloid antibodies. And you know, the the next rational thing is if we get rid of it, people's cognitive issues either will stabilize or improve as compared to like if we did nothing. Yeah. So where are we right now with uh, specifically the antibody the antibodies towards amyloid? Yeah. So the antibodies have cured Alzheimer's. They all have cured Alzheimer's. Yeah. Very different. Cured the disease, right? Yes, yes. The mice are delighted, but um, none of them so far have proven efficacious in human disease. Now it's quite an interesting story. So initially, the antibodies that were tried in people were dosed too low. There's no doubt about that. Eventually, as we got to higher doses, we learned that there is a significant side effect where if you uh, dose antibodies high enough to remove amyloid in the brain, that actually leads to a risk of developing inflammation or hemorrhage, something called amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, ARIA, and that comes in the form of edema more commonly or hemorrhage. And so... Um, there was a lot of concern about um, this uh, specific side effect, and that caused kind of a mess in some of the clinical trials that were done because um, the dosing, um, now I'll, I'll, I'll make a long story short and say that what we've learned is that this is something you have to monitor with MRIs, but in most cases, like two thirds or more of cases, it's entirely asymptomatic. And then in other people, it causes very mild symptoms and it can actually be treated through if you reduce dose and then slowly escalate back up. But there was a lot of worry about, you know, do no harm. And so the dosing of these drugs got messed up in a lot of trials and it got messed up in a very specific way because people who carry ApoE4, we said about 60 or 70 percent of people with Alzheimer's have ApoE4. Um, were at higher risk of getting this side effect. And so they systematically received lower doses. And that made a lot of trials that are difficult to interpret. And that's part of the story of aducanumab. So let me tell the story of aducanumab. It's a really fascinating story. Mm -hmm. This is a drug that made the cover of nature, you know, my lifelong dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, because in a phase 1b, it's a humanized, I should say, monoclonal antibody. It, it targets both aggregated and soluble forms of the A-beta um, polypeptide. And on the cover of Nature, it showed in a phase 1b that it can very dramatically remove signal, amyloid PET signal. And so people who had a, you know, a lot of red signal and you treat them and in a dose dependent manner, you can just wash, watch that amyloid clear. And so it generated a lot of excitement 
this was the first drug that very definitively hit the target and lowered amyloid. And then the next question was, you know, would that translate into clinical efficacy? Would it slow decline? And so that led to the launching of two phase three studies called Emerge and Engage. And these were uh, randomized control trials that were done in parallel, a little bit staggered, of um, either placebo, low dose, or high dose aducanumab. And there were, I think, about 1,600 patients in each trial that were randomized to receive one of these three treatments. And um, in March of 2019, there was a sudden announcement by the sponsor that the trial was terminated because of a pooled futility analysis that was done in both trials together that showed that there was a low likelihood of hitting the clinical endpoint. Mm. The clinical endpoint was a statistically significant difference on a scale called uh, the clinical dementia rating scale sum of boxes, which is a measure of functional impairment in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so a lot of patients were actually really upset. There was a lot of excitement about this trial. Some mm -hmm. patients felt like they were benefiting. Who knows if that's true or not? They were devastated when this trial was terminated. And, um, you know, then, you know, life moves along. And about seven months later, the company said, wait a minute. <laughs> we actually have more data now. We've reanalyzed it. And we actually are calling one of these two phase three studies, the eMERGE study, positive. It hit the endpoint. And the second one is negative. Mm -hmm. And I remember this was uh, close to Halloween because one of our fellows made a meme of like, you know, a skeleton arm rising from the grave <laughs> and called it aducanumab. <laughs> so this drug that was dead in the water was suddenly resuscitated. And um, the sponsor, Biogen, I think we can say it on the podcast, um, went to the FDA with these data and asked for FDA approval based on one very compelling, what they felt was a very compelling um, clinical trial result. I talked a lot about dosing because they've tried to explain why one study was positive in the high dose group. I should clarify that. Both were negative in the low dose group. In the other trial, the high-dose group did no better than placebo. In fact, it did worse than placebo. <laughs> and so you, you, got, you got these very discrepant results. One of the differences was the dosing of the drug in APOE4 carriers. And in the positive study, they were able to escalate the dose because they made a protocol change. And that protocol change occurred earlier in recruitment for one of the trials than the other. And so the trial that was negative, fewer E4 carriers were dosed at high dose. The trial that was positive, more of them were. So in a post hoc analysis, yeah. this is something that has been used to try to explain the discrepancy between the results. And then, you know, the company worked with the FDA for uh, months trying to understand the data. And, you know, some have said that this relationship might have been too close between the sponsor and the FDA. Yeah, there was and a brilliant all, public citizens document that I read that really went after kind of the FDA process. Um, yeah. So, sorry for you know, interrupting. Yeah, no, depending on your perspective, you know, is the FDA really working hard to try to understand if there is a signal for a disease that desperately needs a treatment or are yeah. they getting too cozy with a sponsor? You know, it, it depends. And so all of this sort of culminated in an FDA advisory committee that happened on November 6, 2020, you know, a calm week in our country, not much <laughs> going on that week. But, you know, after the election on Tuesday, Friday, there was this FDA advisory committee and um, there was a presentation from the sponsor and the FDA that was tried to show the data in a very positive light. There was another review by the FDA statistician that was very skeptical about the results of the trial and the post hoc analyses that were used to sort of rationalize the different results. That um, was actually not presented at the meeting, but the advisors read, you know, to the FDA statistical review. And at the end of a quite a contentious advisory committee meeting, uh, basically unanimously, the advisory committee uh, recommended against approval of the drug based on the current data. Mm -hmm. 
We still don't have an FDA ruling on this. We're going to, as we record this, we're on April 1st. The um, FDA ruling will occur, I believe, on June 7th or earlier. And, you know, I think there are some people who still think the FDA might offer some sort of approval or conditional approval, even though the advisory committee was very much against it. You know, um, I am skeptical about, you know, post hoc analyses. I do think there has been a trend, and we don't have time to go in detail into all the data that suggests that amyloid lowering therapies have a modest clinical benefit in early stages. This is based on more than one trial. So I would not be shocked if you know the trial that was positive was correct and there were some issues. But I think the only way to really resolve that is to do another well-designed phase three RCT, mm -hmm. dosing the drug correctly for everyone. Yeah. And then you'll see basically, are you able to replicate these results or not? And to me, that is the uh, most logical path forward. Thank I you. do worry that if the drug is approved based on the current data, there's really going to be a polarization in the field where some people are very gung-ho pro and some are very gung-ho against, and patients are going to be stuck in the middle. And depending on which doctor you talk to, mm -hmm. people are going to be very confused about whether this drug is beneficial for them, whether they should be treated it with it. And again, as we talked about, the side effects are not inconsequential. And the cost it will is likely to be high. Yeah. And this, you know, involves monthly infusion. So it's not a, yeah. you know, it's not a benign intervention. You're right. So you got I heard it's probably like fifty thousand dollars a year for the, the medicine. You gotta get your uh your your pet amyloid beforehand or your biomarkers. And then about I think about forty percent had some imaging abnormalities. So you get your pre MRI. Uh, you get your post MRI and potentially monthly, or do you think it's like going to be Q month, Q three month like MRIs um, at least in the beginning? Because it sounds like this type of edema happens earlier on. Is that right? It does. It happens earlier on, so um, not quite monthly, and we don't yeah. know exactly what the label will say in terms of safety, but it would require some monitoring. That's correct. So a lot that's going on, and the. the I guess my question to you is if we take a big step back and let's assume, let's pretend engaged trial never happened. You didn't have this negative trial. We have this eMERGE trial where the negative low dose didn't seem to work, but the, the high dose did. Like a 0.4 difference on CDRSB. So the, the, yeah. how, it's an 18 point scale. I always thought like, I like one, one and a half points, like a clinic, clinically meaningful difference is, is 0.4 something like how how do you think about that obviously that probably some people do better and some people do worse this is a population based like average your thoughts on like is this a clinical meaningful difference i think it's very hard to measure at early disease stage which is where we're treating now clinically meaningful differences because these um, scales are really designed they accelerate in the dementia stage and right now a lot of the focus on treatment is in the mci stage or earlier and so you know if you just look at the progression in placebo i think it was around one and a half points on the sum of boxes and so you know you really need a powerful drug which is basically going to stop any progression okay yeah. in order to measure a larger change and so the, the challenge is, you know, when you're doing these trials over, you know, 78 weeks or whatever, you know, 18 months is pretty typical. How do you measure change yeah. um, in a way where you can really judge? And, you know, one thing we don't know is, you know, if you were then to extrapolate that, say, you know, someone might live another 10, 12 years from their diagnosis of MCI, if, you know, would that be a 0.4 change per year that would over time, you know, kind of separate and turn into something that might be very meaningful in terms of mm -hmm. preserving quality of life? Or is it going to be like, um, you know, the, the cholinesterase inhibitors where those curves are kind of parallel after some time and there's not a, you know, a cumulative benefit? We don't know. Someone very smart, I won't say who it is, said, you know, one problem with this disease is that, you know, at the time that we might actually be successful with, with treatment, we won't be able to measure that with clinical measures. And by the time we can measure things with clinical measures, it might be too late to treat. So we're kind of yeah. caught in this catch-22. 
And so I, I understand what you're saying about, you know, clinically meaningful, but I think that setting that context of, you know, how much does this scale or another scale kind of change over the duration of a clinical trial, it's important to set that expectation. And I guess another question, because it sounded like this drug did a really good job of getting rid of amyloid. Yeah. But we didn't see a big, like, even if you trust, like, the one of four positive findings. So uh, the low doses didn't work. The high dose in the other study didn't work. And the emerge high dose did. But kind of, you know, not not a whole lot over the course of the 18 months. Given that, that it can, like, we can cure, what do you call it again? Mouse. Uh, Alzheimer's. Yes. Alzheimer's. We can cure my, Alzheimer's. my basic science cause are going to kill me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can cure Alzheimer's, but we can't really dramatically change their symptoms, at least over the course of the, the, the 18 months. How much does that say about the whole amyloid hypothesis too? You know, I don't think that the amyloid hypothesis um, is likely to be entirely incorrect because of the genetic data. We know that mutations that lead to overproduction of amyloid are sufficient to cause disease. But um, I think what we don't know is how much amyloid lowering in, you know, um, is likely to change the course. So I can give you sort of my opinion because I know we're running short on time. Yeah, but, give us your um, opinion, Gil. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, if amyloid lowering therapies are gonna work, they're gonna work very early on and try to prevent the spread of tau, which amyloid does seem to facilitate. And it's really that spread of tangles through the brain that correlates with decline. And so um, if these are gonna work, they might work very early on you know, ideally you would have an oral medication. If you're thinking more about prevention than treatment, you don't want to be treating people preventively with, you know, MAB infusions. Right. Uh, but um, I think that, you know, drugs that are going to slow the progression of tau are more likely to be efficacious at the stage of clinical impairment, because there is that very strong correlation between how tau spreads and the symptoms that people develop. And, you know, with PET scans, we're learning that it's not incidental. You know, people used to talk about the tangles as the tombstones of the dying neurons. That is not correct. Mm -hmm. You can look at where tau is in the brain and anticipate which brain areas are going to fail in the coming years. And there are studies that have shown that. So I think where the field will ultimately, um, you know, end up is in a combination therapy where we are treating more than one aspect of this biology. I think amyloid lowering therapies are likely to have some role at, especially at an early stage in that sort of cocktail. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think that really other drug targets are more likely to be, you know, more robustly efficacious in later stages. And, you know, as to think back to early in our conversation, if we can really understand at an individual patient's level, why are they developing, you know, the symptoms and the biology, um, we're going to, you know, kind of where cancer is, where you can really, you know, take a biopsy and understand the specific mutations that are driving the tumor in that patient. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then I think we'll be able to make really powerful gains in our ability to treat the disease. So we're just at the beginning stages of that. Someone, I'll leave you with one analogy. Someone compared aducanumab to AZT, mm. you know, in thinking about HIV treatment, yeah. you know, horrible drug, lots of problems, lots of toxicities, but it was the first one that yeah. sort of opened the door to much more effective therapies ultimately for people living with HIV. And I don't know if it's going to be aducanumab or another one of these, but I do think that that's kind of where the field is right now. We're at the AZT stage. And um, one of these drugs will probably be approved eventually. And um, it will open the door, however, to more effective approaches. And um, so, you know, stay tuned. I think yeah. it's going to be quite a roller coaster in the next few years. It, it sounds, I mean, uh, I am eagerly awaiting uh, for all our Wall Street bet folks out there uh, on Biogen. I'm not sure which way we're going to go on that one. But um, it sounds like the next couple of years are really going to be exciting. Gil, I could talk to you for another three hours about this. Yeah. I really appreciate all your time. 
Um, I am just absolutely fascinated what this will bring over the next couple of years and um, appreciate kind of your thoughts and sharing it with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. But before we end, wait, which song are you going to sing, Alex? Now, are you going to sing the, the Adukanamab song or no, the. No, that was just a preview. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're, going, we're going back to I'm Not Going to Miss You. Okay. I'm never going to hold you like I did. I'll say I love you to the kids You're never gonna see it in my eyes It's not gonna hurt me when you cry I'm never gonna know what you go through All the things I say or do All the hurt and all the pain One thing selfishly remains I'm not gonna miss you I'm not gonna miss you Ugh, the heart just breaks um, Gil, uh, a very, very big thank you for joining us today. Um, I learned a ton and it's great having you on, uh, the podcast with us. Yeah, no, thanks a lot for, for inviting me. It was a lot of fun and hopefully we can continue the dialogue. Um, yeah, we got to have uh, you back in like a year once everything is approved right. by the FDA and the world is a very, it might be, place. you know, I hope the FDA doesn't approve it, but, um, yeah. You know, the Denanumab study, which we didn't have time to get into, is a much cleaner study. And uh -huh. it did show that lowering amyloid reduced the spread of tau. So there's something there, but it's that was, very... That was a phase two study? Phase right? two, yeah. So oh. they're going to proceed with a phase, with a larger uh, replication study. Yeah, uh, hopefully they don't stop it midway through. The other thing that was great about, yeah, well, the other thing that was great about that study is they were treating, it was kind of like induction therapy. So they treated people until the plaques were gone and then they stopped treating and just monitored to see if the plaques come back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, um, you know, is, uh, again, a much more appealing sort of, if you're going to have these MAP yeah. treatments, like having them be not, you know, everlasting, but really, you know, that's... Yeah, in part, that's kind of my worry because I know what's going to happen is like 10 years on, they're still on aducanumab. They're in hospice. They're still getting their aducanumab monthly injections Yeah. with at best a, a small signal that it works. Um, that's as also a palliative care doctor and a hospice doctor, that, that also scares the bejesus out of me. Yeah, no, that would be a really bad outcome. I totally agree. Um, but yeah, let's see. I hope the FDA does the right thing and does a phase three. But at this point, who knows? All yeah. bets are off. Right. We'll see. Put your money down. Um, uh, well, uh, thanks everybody for joining us too for this podcast. And a big thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. Good night, everybody. Good night.